Welcome back to the last presentation of our conference by Wouter Reichbosch. Professor Reichbosch is assistant professor at the Vrijel Universiteit Bruxelles in Brussels in Belgium or VUB. And we are delighted he's joined us today because he specializes in the early modern history of the Low Countries and has published on issues of inequality, consumption, and social relations. He recently published an article on the acceptance and valuation of tea in the Low Countries and past and present. Uh, so, Wuta, we are looking forward to your sort of taking us away from some of the frameworks that we have been uh, looking at here, geographical frameworks. Professor Reichbosch is talk is titled, Were All Cups of Tea Created Equal? Tea and the Erosion of Social Barriers in the Low Countries During the Enlightenment. Looking forward to your talk, so take it away. Thank you very much. I'll try to share my screen and also see the presenter view. So, Looking which... good. Yes, this mm -hmm. looks good. Oh, wait a minute, no. wait a minute. No, we're not no. in presenter view yet, sorry. No, you can't uh, see water because we can sorry. see your text. Yeah, we can okay. see your text. So, so I should. Be... Yeah. Uh, so I should probably switch switch the the. Mm, 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 mm. So how do I do this? Yeah. I... Go to the presenter view. Yeah, I have two screens. That's why ah, it's okay. doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, there should be a button somewhere to switch the the screens. No. Okay. I, I'll I'll just. We can still see what you're doing. Do you want to toggle once? Is, to is this better? Yeah, That's good. This is, yay! We have, this is good? Yes. Yeah. Mission okay. successful. And I'll, it also works if I go to the next slide, right? Yeah, it all works. It looks great. Right? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's a it's a real honor as well as a pleasure to be able to participate in this, um, in this event and to be able to listen uh, over the past two days uh, also and, and, and today. Um, to the very interesting papers in uh, this uh, conference. Um, so thank you um, uh, to the organizers for inviting me um, and, and for the, the really perfect uh, organization. Um, my talk will be on um, the early modern low countries and the introduction of tea there, and especially uh, the uh, social consequences of, of that. Um, I'll try to keep the time as well a little bit. Okay. In his entry on tea in Diderot and d'Alembert's Encyclopédie in the second half of the 18th century, Louis de Jaucourt described the enormous popularity of tea drinking in Europe. And he expressed his surprise at the fact that no less than eight to 10 million pounds of tea were imported into Europe each year. This was indeed a rather extraordinary amount since less than a century earlier, practically no one in Europe had been familiar with tea. Um, at the end of the 17th century, probably less than 100,000 pounds flowed into the continent. And after to tobacco and sugar, tea was thus one of the first global commodities to change from a luxury to a staple good for European consumers. Only two centuries before the publication of the Encyclopédie, around the end of the 16th century, people in the Low Countries and in Western Europe more generally could first encounter tea in letters, ethnographies, and diaries, yet actually tasting tea remained the prerogative of the lucky few throughout most of the 17th century. In inventories of household goods, we find the first teacups mentioned in Holland only in the 1660s and the first teapots uh, in the 1670s. In newspapers, adver advertisements, auction lists, official trade statistics of the Dutch East India Company, tea was actually still rather rare before 1700. From these humble beginnings in the late 17th century, tea would soon become an object of mass consumption. By the end of the 18th century, even in the proto-industrial countryside of rural Flanders, which was definitely not the most prosperous region of the Low Countries, over half of all households owned tea cups or pots. And even among the poor in Amsterdam, in the mid 18th century, almost half of all households were equipped to drink tea at home. Now, my question here is, what effects did this sort in terms of social inequality and social relations. If tea was one of the first global mass-consumed commodities of the modern world, then what made this possible? What made it possible then, while it had not materialized before 
and what were the effects on the social order of European society. So what does the rise of global mass consumption in early modern Europe tell us about underlying changes in the social structure? Was it a reflection of a broader social change? And maybe what effect did the emergence of these new global consumption patterns themselves have on the traditional social hierarchies of old regime Europe? So did T, in other words, help to transform the early modern social order? Why would we expect an effect on social hierarchy in the first place? Well, for at least 40 years now, historians have been debating an 18th century phenomenon, which was labeled the consumer revolution by Neil McKendrick. He and others observed that during this period, more households began to consume more than ever before. McKendrick himself believed that this consumer revolution was the result of a narrowing of social differences in England, which resulted in increased class competition, the spread of new fashions, and more social emulation. Since then, other historians, such as Jan de Vries and Maxine Berg, have argued for a reverse causality. Maybe, they argued, the introduction of new global commodities, such as tea, tobacco, and cottons, undermined the social hierarchies that had previously been imposed. Because these consumer goods were more flexible and more readily accessible to middle-class consumers, they could transform existing expectations and attitudes towards luxury and social class. More recently, William Sewell, for instance, uh, in his book that I think appeared last year, has argued that the growing dominance of market relations in 18th century France inevitably led to new conceptualiz conceptualizations of social inequality. This enabled the emergence of what he called the idea of civic equality, which was the opposite of the status-based privileged society of the Ancien Regime, and would underpin the fundamental uh, tenets of the French Revolution. So in brief, the rise of new affordable luxuries, such as those associated with tea, porcelain and sugar has been linked in very general terms by historians to the dismantling of the rigid social hierarchies of old regime Europe. But how did this work in practice? Who consumed tea? How did they consume tea? That's what I want to explore uh, a little bit further uh, or a little bit deeper perhaps in this, in this paper. So for this talk, I've looked specifically at the presence of tea related objects in a medium sized town in Flanders, current-day Belgium, part of the Low Countries. Flanders was one of the most highly urbanized and commercialized regions of Europe. It was not as well connected to the Asian trade as Holland in the Dutch Republic was. Nevertheless, it did play an important role in the spread of tea in 18th century Europe. For a brief period in the 1720s, between 1722 and 27, it was the seat of the so-called Austin Company, which traded directly with, um, uh, with Bengal and with, with, with um, uh, China. Unlike the Dutch and the English East India companies, its merchants did not gain access, or at least that's what they argued themselves, to the better quality and more expensive varieties, um, in particular of, of green tea, nor did they have access to vast East Asian trading empires that allowed for expensive, uh, expansive um, intra-Asian trade. But instead, the ships of the Austin Company were forced to, first of all, sail directly back to Austin with their teas, and secondly, to focus almost exclusively on the cheaper varieties, um, uh, particularly of Bohia tea, that they could buy. The large quantities of cheaper teas imported in Austin were soon smuggled into England, Scotland, France, the Dutch Republic, and this coincided with what you see here on this graph, with a rapid lowering of the average tea price for the cheapest varieties. Even though the Austin Company would soon cease to exist, the English and Dutch East India companies quickly adapted their own commercial strategies and also began to import larger quantities of cheaper teas in the 1720s. So as you can see on this graph of the, the average tea price, oh, sorry, in Amsterdam, um, Antwerp and uh, London, the period of the 1720s marks a drastic drop in the price of tea. The analysis in this paper is based on archival records of probate or after-death inventories. These after-death inventories are lists of household goods left and recorded upon the death of a parent with a non-adult child, so younger than 21 years of age. 
These archival sources offer some important clues as to the timing of the spread of domestic tea consumption throughout the Low Countries. Furthermore, I've linked these inventories to text lists in this town of Aalste. This, this is where the town of Aalste, Flanders, was more or less located. It had more or less 8,000 uh, inhabitants. And what I've done is I've linked these inventories to text lists, which listed all the households in this town, to be able to determine the wealth position of all these individuals or all these households, ranking them from poor to rich. You can see now, uh, you see, I've done this here in quintile groups, which means groups of 20% of the, of the um, uh, population. With quintile one here, Q1, um, representing the top, the top poor, uh, sorry, the 20% poorest households in the town, and quintile five representing the 20% richest households. And these are the, sem the four sample periods that I studied. And you can see that the distribution of inventories is unequal. So the Poorer households in the poorer quintiles are underrepresented, but still it's important to note that even though these poorer households were underrepresented, they also did leave inventories, and so it's possible to also reconstruct their domestic material culture. Based on these sources, it is thus possible to trace, in very general terms, when tea drinking at home became popular in the Low Countries. The graph on the left here shows the presence of tea-related items in households throughout the southern Low Countries, so current-day Belgium, more or less. It's expressed as uh, the percentage of households owning at least one item referring to the consumption of tea. The green li lines are the large cities, uh, um, Antwerp and Ghent. The red ones are the smaller towns, including Aals, the city that I'll show in a bit more detail later on. And then the blue ones are rural parishes. And it's clear that the first half of the 18th century was a crucial period of transition, when tea stopped being a luxury for the few and became present in the majority of households. This happened first in the larger cities, such as Antwerp, Antwerp and Amsterdam, then in smaller towns such as Aalst, but also rather quickly with some delay in the countryside. The graph on the right shows the average percentage of households in Holland and Flanders, so the two most commercialized provinces in the Low Countries, owning tea-related items. This illustrates how tea was more quickly embraced in the northern Low Countries, so in Holland uh, first, um, where global commerce was much more direct, and slightly later, so through the influence of the Dutch East India Company, and slightly later in the southern Low Countries, where it's more uh, picking up between 1710 and 1750. Now let's look a little bit closer at this case of this town of Aalst. How did tea spread within this town of Aalst? So a provincial town of about 8,000 inhabitants. If you look at the green bars here, so the first bar between the four sample periods, you can see that by the end of the 18th century, almost 90% of households owned items that were directly associated with the consumption of tea. A little more than a century before that, um, uh, hardly anyone had, had any uh, tea-related items. In most cases, these items uh, uh, were teapots, uh, here the, the uh, orange um, uh, bars, uh, or cups, uh, the purple ones. But if we look at the spread of specific items, it's also clear that during the 18th century, um, it was not just the spread of teapots and, and cups, but also continued increase in objects other than teapots and teacups. Tea boxes, uh, the pink uh, um, bars here, for instance, but also tea tables, milk jugs, sugar scissors, sugar thongs, tea trays, tea braziers, those kind of things. These are included in the brown, um, the, uh, the, the pink, uh, and uh, the green and the yellow uh, um, bars here. So that all went into uh, towards a, a greater elaboration of a more refined tea ritual at home. Now, who were the first consumers of tea in Aalst? If we look at those households where tea-related objects were mentioned in the first two sample periods, so 1670 and 1710, um, it's clear that these were predominantly the households of the rich. Uh, so the, the highest quintiles, these are ranked here from the poorest 
So the, the, the lightest, um, and the lightest, brightest colors and the darkest colors are the richest ones, uh, most to the, to the right. So these are the richest 20%. These are uh, the ones just below that and so on. Um, so dur during these first two sample periods, um, we see these T-related objects mostly in the richest quintiles of um, the wealth distribution in Aalst. However, in a very brief span of time, of about 30 to 40 years, between 1710 and 1750, we find that this was no longer the case. Around 1750, even the majority of poor, poor households, uh, so the poorest 40% of uh, the population in Aalst, even they had, uh, even there in these groups, more than 50% of the households owned tea-related objects. The same pattern is evident for both teapots here in the top left corner, so the green uh, graph, um, where again we see first uh, that it's, well, there's, there are a few exceptions, but uh, there are almost no people have, having tea, owning tea pots on the one hand and, and cups here uh, in, in the, the bottom right, um, except for the richer households. And then really very suddenly there is a massive democratization or massification, you could say, of the consumption of tea. And it's spread across all social layers in this um, uh, urban uh, society. There's really not a great distinction here in uh, the frequency of um, these teapots within these, um, these different social groups in Aalst by the end of the 18th century. It might be interesting to place this pattern of rapid spread from an exclusive luxury to an object of mass consumption in a wider context. How was tea described in scientific and pop popular literature in the Low Countries during this time, for instance? I will not go too deeply into this here. There are many more exp experts uh, who have uh, talked about this before. Um, and I've also discussed this specifically for the Low Countries um, elsewhere. But if we look at the first period, until the beginning of the 18th century, we see that tea was very widely praised, for instance, by medical practitioners, such as this, this, uh, Leiden, this physician in Leiden, Cornelius Bontecou, um, who very much praised the healthiness of uh, drinking tea, but also in popular ballads and plays, we, we see a lot of um, praise for the healthy uh, and are also morally beneficial effects of drinking tea. But this became decidedly more ambiguous from the beginning of the 18th century and much more pronouncedly so uh, by the second half of the 18th century when tea was increasingly described as an object of waste, as a symbol of gluttony also. And we see a start of this in this, this um, emblem book um, from the beginning uh, of the 18th century, Jan Leuken's Lees aan Huisraad, a very popular emblem book um, published in 1711, where uh, tea and coffee are um, um, are described or are linked with lust and gluttony, a theme that would find repeated expression throughout the 18th century. Now, what were the social implications of the rapid transition of tea from luxury to necessity in the first half of the 18th century? If we look a bit more closely at the tea-related items mentioned in the inventories, it turns out that the general democratization of tea did not imply that social differences could no longer be expressed through drinking tea. On the contrary, the ways in which tea were consumed became an important site for communicating social status and position. The inventories offer some glimpses into how not everyone consumed tea in the same way or how different households consumed tea in different ways. And some of these are very trivial, but nonetheless, uh, these inventories show us um, uh, very indirectly, of course, how social hierarchies and social inequalities related or um, were reflected in the ways that people consume tea. Tea cups, for instance, and we know that they were spread very evenly from the middle of the 18th century across society, but it doesn't mean that they were all the same. Tea cups could be coarse or fine, for instance, and the inventories often describe them that way. And if you look at this graph here on the left side of the slide, uh, you can see that coarse, broken, or worn cups were much more often found in poorer than in richer households. So uh, here, here on the left, uh, the, the, the brighter bars are the poorer ones. Um, they much more often had these um, 
coarser uh, or uh, these teacups explicitly described as uh, coarse or broken or worn rather than the fine ones which were explicitly men mentioned as fine we see these much more often in the inventories of richer households for middle class and poor households the items were to be found mostly in the kitchen whereas for the better off tea sets were of course also present in the kitchen because they had multiple sets of, of uh, teacups but tea sets were also present in dining rooms and parlors and bedrooms and other chambers and often specifically set aside for specific occasions or to receive guests. Status differences, I'm not sure if this is very clear, but status differences could also be expressed by using teapots or tea boxes in silver or porcelain, for instance. These were still very rare. So even if a lot of people, almost every, everyone by the end of the 18th century, owned teapots or teacups. There are a few only that were mentioned as being specifically in porcelain or having a silver, uh, silver component uh, to them, compared to, for instance, the much more um, ubiquitous copper, iron, or tin equivalents. And of course, it should be said that most of these teapots or, or cups, uh, the materials were not mentioned. So if they were mentioned, it's often that they were, um, um, that the, the material from which they were manufactured was uh, special or exceptional in some way. Richer households also had the opportunity to serve tea in a more elaborate and sophisticated manner. Ruta, using you have, yes? uh, we are at the 20 minute mark, just a reminder. Okay, so I have, you two, about, three minutes? Yeah, you have about five minutes, yeah. Okay, Go that's on. good. That should be fine. So richer households also had the opportunity to serve tea in a more elaborate and sophisticated manner. For instance, using tea trays, tea tables, tea braziers, tea spoons, sugar scissors, etc. which is measured here in the graph on the left, uh, where I made some kind of index uh, of uh, hot drinks, apparel, so accessories that were not strictly, strictly necessary, but could be part of um, a, a tea or coffee drinking ritual. So uh, the average score on this amenity, so if you have different of these, these um, items, your average score or your score will be higher. And you see that the richer the group here, uh, so the, the, the more on the right, the richer the group, um, the more, the higher their score on this, uh, on this uh, accessories index. By the end of the 18th century, nearly everyone could drink tea at home, but the manner in which it was served differed more strongly than before. Moreover, the richer the households, the more likely they were to own multiple sets of cups, um, uh, which is shown in the graph on the right here, allowing them to set aside special tea sets for particular um, occasions. <coughs> Sorry. It is remarkable that this diversity in the material culture surrounding tea drinking became larger and more sophisticated among the upper classes in the second half of the 18th century, precisely the period when almost everyone had basic access to tea and discussions surrounding the moral and social effects of tea drinking became more heated. To conclude, to Louis de Jocourt's entry on tea in L'Encyclopédie, where he observed on the expensive imperial teas that, and I quote, it is everywhere the case that the most useless manners are the costliest, especially among those who have nothing to distinguish them from the public other than their expenses. This sharp judgment seems to have been aimed not at the aristocracy or the nobility, who had plenty to distinguish themselves from the public, but at newly emerging social groups that aim to distinguish themselves by copying or emulating the expensive lifestyles of the nobility. The introduction of tea in 18th century households in the Low Countries unintentionally created social and moral confusions. Tea quickly became a common household item used regularly by all sorts of people, from a symbol of health and luxury that turned into a marker of gluttony and spendthrift over the course of only a few decades. In a Dutch play from 1760, a character named Quistgoed, which means wastes well, um, or wastes a lot, serves her guests to excessively expensive tea, which she says herself, is usually only drank by the emperor of China and his wives. Her father, Ernst, which means uh, earnestness or seriousness, reproaches her for trying to copy the lifestyle of the arist aristocracy. While he himself and the men of his generation had helped to build their nation's wealth on the values of thrift and diligence. Remarkably, by the second half of the 18th century, even Dutch merchants viewed tea not as the basis of their wealth, but rather of their ruin. 
if in Renaissance Europe, people were what they wore, ate and drank, a sumptuary legislation could be imagined to keep people in their appropriate social ranks and stations by determining and fixing their lifestyle, then tea helped in the 18th century to bring this old world to an end. With the rapid expansion of global trade and the resulting shift from tea as a luxury to a mass-consumed commodity, everyone could witness firsthand how relative differences in lifestyle actually were and how rapidly they could change. The only thing that now separated the rich from the poor was the quantity and quality of their tea consumption, among other uh, um, uh, popular goods. A difference of degrees rather than of kinds. Throughout the 18th century, social distances could increasingly be measured by the number of cups and teapots people owned, rather than by the privileges and titles with which they were born. Or that would be the argument that I would distill from this. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing this. Thanks, Buta. That was amazing. And special thanks to you for carrying the conference into its last stages. Uh, your <laughs> research really broadened our lens beyond Britain, North America, and of course, um, looking beyond even China uh, at some level, right? So it was fascinating to hear. And what was also very useful was to see the kind of meticulous research you've done with probate records. And I'm always in awe of people who count the number of teacups and teapots. And I was going to ask you a question about teaspoons, but I won't, I won't be that cruel today. Uh, but we should open up the floor for questions. And uh, let's go to our Q&A box, which seems quite active. So here we go. Our first question for you, Vuta. How did you get the data? Um, I, 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 well, I did this during my PhD, which is already... Um, <laughs> That more than 10 years ago um, and and I, I I basically went to the archives um, and um, sifted through all these um, records it, it's it's a bit like notarial archives but specifically um, compiled by the orphan chamber of this the city of Aals, but we have them in, in a lot of cities in the low countries um, where people were forced and I see that there's not another question on this as well so why were these after that inventories made uh, because um, when someone, um, when a parent died, and and and, and one of the children uh, was still a minor, so they, but if they hadn't married before the age of twenty-one, um, then their share of um, of the inheritance had to be safeguarded, had to be uh, somehow recorded, um, and that was the reason why legally, uh, according to customary law, in in in, in most of of the places in the low countries um it was applied but also in 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 britain for instance it was uh, necessary to have a list of all the household goods um recorded it's not always very detailed so sometimes they just say well we sold all the uh, <laughs> everything that they owned and this was the um the, the revenue from this but in a lot of cases it, it was actually very um uh, detailed um and and that's so i basically went to the archives and recorded all this in 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 large databases and then uh, so that's what i did quite a long time ago in uh, for my phd yeah terrific thank you and we have a question from catherine burnett uh, could you please tell me what scissors were used for in a tea service? I, <laughs> I don't really know. I, this, is, this is something that I encountered only once. Uh, maybe someone else can help me out here. It's recorded as a, I think it's, I, I think it, it, it could, it's not, it's probably not literally a scissor, but something to take a sugar. So I, I don't know, to, to put sugar in a teacup or something. I. I don't really know. So that's the downside from being a historian uh, or, or to being a historian and working with these kind of sources, you see descriptions of items um, and you don't always know what they what they mean. Uh, so I'm, I'm through a very indirect way trying to see what these items could have been like. And, and of course, I know that, of course, museum collections uh, or iconography, they have their own, well, limitations in the sense that it's probably not very representative of what a poor household in the 18th century, uh, 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 the sort of teapot or teacups that they that they own. But on the other hand, I often very generally see, oh, two teapots, but I don't know the material or the quality or how, how or whether they were decorated or what they were used for or how often they were used. Or so sometimes I see that um, teacups were put on display so they, they were on the mantelpiece for instance but uh, so you don't really know 
Uh, how, how does this reflect actual changes in consumption? Uh, how, do they use it often? Do they use it only on Sundays? Do they use it for guests or for themselves? So we try on, in a very indirect way to reconstruct this. Uh, but sometimes I just have to admit that I don't know what these items were for. Um, <laughs> so so there, yeah, any, any suggestions would be very... Um, yeah, this is the mystery of the scissors, then. We need to keep yeah. this in mind. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Gina's dropped something into the chat. Let's see. Ah, scissor-like clippers were used to cut lumps of sugar off a cone of sugar oh. up to the 19th century. So your guess was right. Yeah. Okay, th thank you so much. Yeah, there you that, go. So, and so we will ask Gina's question now, the same person who solved the mystery of the scissors. Um, do you think the fact that water for tea was boiled uh, means it had perceived health benefits as compared to the risks of drinking unboiled water, which was likely to be contaminated by microorganisms. So I guess question of health and hygiene at the time. Well, I'm I'm not an expert in this. I've looked at um, so yeah, I've I've looked at 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 the, the the medical literature published in the low countries, but it's not, of course, not all these ideas originated in the low countries. But but for instance, at the University of Leiden in Holland, there were quite extensive debates uh, in in second half of the 17th century on the benefits of tea. Um, and well, to me, well, it seems to have been um, based on um, rivaling medical theories about. Um, um well the the traditional way that spices in the humoral um uh, theories um uh were interpreted and then the newer ideas based on alkalids and uh um yeah the the, the newer theories that were being developed at Leiden in the second half of the 17th century well, tea played an important role in that, in trying to uh, see how how the beneficial effects could be um, could be uh, determined, whether it was minerals or whether it was the the, the, the traditional uh, properties such as the dryness or the heat of of tea. And I've never come across an argument that said that it's about um, the safety of the water until the, late in the 18th century. So that could just be that I didn't. Well, that that's just something that I didn't uh, uh, catch. But it's not something that was often mentioned in the, in the 17th century, at least in the sources that I um, consulted. Um, yeah, and of course, okay. it, it would have been the opposition uh, that is most men mentioned in the 18th century is to to drinking beer, and of course, then the water would also have been boiled. So mm -hmm. there, there, you don't often see, or I didn't encounter any discussions of drinking tea rather than drinking water it's drinking tea rather than drinking wine or beer um mm. so so that kind of solves the the uh, this this um, this issue i think so from water to milk uh, we have a question from bob dancing a high grade tea cannot stand with milk and sugar because it'll take too it'll taste too milky a smuggled or cheap tea was frequently adulterated mixed with willow or other bitter herbs and needed a lot of sugar and milk for rich was this a ritual for poor, was it a filling and energizing meal? Uh, excellent research. Thanks for sharing. So, any thoughts? Not really. I think that's very interesting. That I I, I didn't think about that. So so maybe I'm I'm interpreting some of these things a bit too linearly in, or or too too um, too much simplified in the sense that if you have more um uh, utensils or accessories or, or things mm -hmm. to to serve the tea with, that it's more elaborate. Although it could also be that the purity of tea, which which doesn't need any milk or sugar to make it uh, um, uh, uh, tasty, that well, that could also, of course, be a marker of uh, of distinction. Um, so, so that's a, it, it's a good thing. It's something that I should um, sh should think about. So, thanks a lot for that suggestion. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, we will return to your objects then, since you've done such an object oriented uh, analysis. Uh, so Bettina has an interesting question here. She says, thank you for your interesting presentation. I was wondering whether the objects that you found in the household inventories were explicitly labeled there as teapots or teacups, etc., or whether these might have also been used for various imported drinks such as chocolate and coffee. Yes, that, that's a, it's a good point. In the, in the case of teapots, it's almost, well, it, it, 
those those are mentioned explicitly, or the ones that I counted here were mentioned explicitly as teapots, yeah? um, because there's also coffee cans or or uh, coffee uh, more uh, um, is is the word most often used. So so these in this case uh, the, where I counted the teapots, it's mentioned specifically as 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 a teapot. Uh, for cups, it's a bit more uh, complicated. You often see tea cups or tea and coffee cups um, mentioned, and they are grouped together, and it's not very easy to determine um, how often contemporary people or the ones doing the appraising of these, these household goods, whether they could distinguish or regularly distinguish between tea and coffee um, uh, cups. It's something that I could go a little bit deeper into, but my impression was that um, they, they often say very generally cups, and then they mean cups for either tea or coffee. Um, and maybe when they specifically say teacups, then then it, well, then then they could have specific properties, um, material qualities that that set them apart as being specifically, um, um, yeah, for for tea consumption. It's something that could do with a bit more refinement in my analysis, probably. Yeah, but in terms of teapots, that that's specifically mentioned as such. Yeah. Terrific. Um, so a question from Emily. Thank you for your presentation. Where were the tea accessories mentioned in the inventories produced and how were they transported to Aust? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, that's a good question. I, I think, um, I suspect that most of these items were actually produced in the Low Countries, in, 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 um, in the Southern Low Countries itself. Uh, so that, um, <laughs> Remarkably, it's actually very, very, you would expect that, for instance, uh, if you take the, the case of porcelain, uh, um, uh, China, where uh, they, they use porcelain, porcelain as, a, as a description for an item in these inventories, whether it's produced in China or not, they say porcelain. Uh, so it, it, apparently uh, to the people drawing up these inventories, it, it wasn't it wasn't something that set it apart, even, even though our obvious first question is usually, well, did, did, was, was it actually porcelain from, from China that was imported or was it uh, kind of uh, the, 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 the import substitutes that they were producing in many of the, the cities uh, um, in, in the low countries themselves? But in these inventories, you can't really tell because it's it's called porcelain. Sometimes it's called glazed earthenware, glazewerk. Um, but but usually they say porcelain, whether it's coming from China um, uh, or not. So it's 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 hard to tell, um, and they don't seem to care a lot in in in, in drawing up these inventories. Um, uh, but I would think that in most cases the, these were um, for uh, most of these inventories and most of these these objects. They were locally produced or imported from the northern Low Countries, from from Holland, um, such as Delftware, for instance. But of course, you sometimes see um, specifically mentioned, um, well, not for tea wares, but for other, like Chinese, uh, Japanese lacquerware, or um, and very rarely uh, Chinese porcelain. But so the the origins are not usually mentioned. They if they when they mention origins of these these goods or the place of manufacture, they usually mean it in the the, the to designate a style. So a Spanish chair or a Chinese um, uh, Chinese porcelain mostly refers to a style rather than the than the place where it was produced. Or at least that's what what my impression was on the in these sources. Yeah. Okay. So this brings me to two more questions. Let's see if we can at least have you answer one. And if we have time, we can go to the second one. So the first question comes from Julian, another ALS related question. Uh, do you know what kind of tea the inhabitants of ALS consumed or elsewhere in the region? Um, not from these, these inventories, um, because in these, these probate inventories, you see the materials that they used to um, to consume tea with, but very rarely did they have any stocks of tea. Uh, so it's not that they had sufficient quantities in in in, in stock or, or storage. Um, only I think in four cases I I found some of that, and and even then, well, and then it's usually the expensive ones. So for instance, imperial green tea or something is mentioned then, but we know from the from the the cargo lists of um, of the Austin company for instance um, but also from import statistics later in the 18th century that the the the, the majority was um, bahia tea uh, 
um, but also some. Um, yeah, I'm I, I, I'm I'm not sure what the, the actual breakdown is, but it's it's more or less similar to what is being imported in 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 Britain and in uh, the Netherlands, uh, but with a bit more emphasis, especially after uh, the 1730s, on, um, on 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 black teas and uh, at least in terms of of, of quantity. Um, Okay, great. So we'll take the last question, but we have two minutes for you to answer that. So rapid, rapid question and rapid answer. Right. All right. So in Britain, so this comes from Markman Ellis. In Britain in this period, high status tea drinking was associated especially with the sociability of women, though of course tea was consumed by men as well as women. I'm wondering about how your analysis might take account, take into account of gender uh, within the moral landscape of aspiration and luxury versus mass market commodity consumption you describe yes that's a that's a that's a very good point i think that that deserves a um yeah i, I had to be short right two minutes okay <laughs> um yeah i think that that that's a very good suggestion i, I think by the end of the 18th century, you see a lot of commentary um, also in some low countries or in low countries in general on this. Uh, so there are a lot of criticisms in general of tea drinking. For instance, that the, the for instance, there's a there's a book written, in, I think 1780 or something, um, by a physician from uh, Mons in in uh, some low countries who argues that uh, the people uh, or the inhabitants inhabitants of the low countries are becoming uh, languished, are becoming weak, and um, effeminate uh, uh, or uh, more feminine because they are drinking too much tea and uh, so it's a very very uh, so, so they they do ascribe um to it uh, feminizing qualities and some of these um um commentaries are seeing that as a very negative uh, thing and they are uh, saying that um, laborers should stick to drinking beers because that's what makes them strong and and mm -hmm. and and manly. So there's a very gendered comp comp component to that, which is also linked to um, criticisms of um, spendthrift. Uh, of of uh, it's also in the example of the play that I gave where it, it's it's often um, the man who brings in the money. Uh, uh, the, so the, the 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 rise of the homemaker. Uh, the the um, uh, the what's it called the breadwinner homemaker household um whereas the, the 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 woman is is spending the money on tea without her husband knowing and and this so you actually see a very gendered discourse in 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 the reaction uh, to that and i think that's something that that could yeah should be explored um uh, especially because it it, it yeah no I, I i absolutely agree yeah and we we have some uh, account books by tea merchants who went through the um, the some of the more uh, remote rural parishes in in, in Flanders, uh, so itinerant uh, tea traders, uh, where you can see who was actually buying uh, the tea, um, and there you see also uh, very specific gender patterns in 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 in, in how how these um, were sold. And I think that that that's something that could play a more important role if you look at this consumer revolution debate or this consumption revolution debate um the 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 role of uh, women both as retailers and as consumers um should probably become a lot more explicit uh, in 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 this whole debate and in this whole um this 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 whole um uh, historiography yeah so thanks Thank i you. think that's a very good suggestion yeah terrific a very interesting parallels in britain as well with the feminization and um, yeah, the gendered question as well. Uh, but thank you, Wouter, for, for navigating these questions so patiently at the end of the day. 